you know, uh, we we, uh, we uh, if you have any doubts on the middle of the talk, please just like put your hand on or put your microphone. It'll be my pleasure to answer if I can. Um, uh, as I was talking with Detina, I'm trying to be really basic and then it become a little more difficult and then I get to basic then they become difficult again. It's, if it is become too difficult, please let me know and if you're not understanding. This is this here is for you. you know whatever is in the slides, I already know. This is for you. So just let me know if you're understanding or not. okay? So it's okay if I, if I share then Tina? Yes, sure, you should be able to share. Let's share my screen. Okay, you're seeing yourself now. Okay, can you guys see my slide? So right yes, now, can. I, can, I can. can only see my slide. <laughs> I thought I would be able still to see you, but I can only see my slide. So if you have any questions, please just know, just say, just have, go to the microphone and say. So first, good night, it's a pleasure to be here. And today I'm going to talk about cellular energetics in space. As Detina said, my name is William da Silveira, and I work on the Staffordshire University, also in the International Space University, and on space, uh, on the topical theme on space omics. And as I used to tell people, you know, this picture here may or maybe not be, be made on the International Space Station. And I was up to you to decide, I'm not going to tell you, Please don't, don't take attention that only one of my legs are floating theoretically. Uh, but Netina asked me to tell uh, about, a little about me for you guys before starting. And I think the most important thing to tell you is that I never dreamed that working with space biology was a possibility for me. I really never thought it would be. Uh, as Detina said, I'm from Brazil, and Brazil is not really that strong on space science at all. And space biology is something very, very difficult to work with in Brazil. So I never really thought it was a possibility. And suddenly it become, you know. And one of the ways it's becoming a uh, possibility for me is because this group called GenLab, that I'm part of, that maybe space data accessible for everyone in the world. So everyone here that we're talking now could go to this website called GenLab and could download data from space there. And you can start to be a space biologist just today if you want. And working with them, I ended up uh, being the first author of this paper on cell here of November 2020. I'm going to talk a little about this today, where I had the honor to be the first author in this paper and was also the cover of the cell that was commemorating the 20 years of science of the International Space Station. How I did it, I don't have a clue, <laughs> but it happened and I used all the chances that appeared in front of me. If you got, uh, so I'm going to divide this in four, uh, four parts. I'm talking about the end first, why is quantum from space. Then I, I'm going to talk how uh, food uh, have energy and how we can use using a mass part of the example and then how we can extract energy from there and how this could be a problem on space. This is why I'm starting by the end first to tell you yep it's a problem not to let you to let you half an hour without understanding why we're talking about this in the first place. So if you go to see the title of my article, the comprehensive multiomics analysis that reveals mitochondrial stress as a central biological rub from space flight impact. And at this point, most of you guys already think you can go to the university as, a, as I am aware. You probably already learned it on high school that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. There's a lot of memes about that, about how the school don't tell you a lot of things, but tells that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And I have good news for you if this is your case, because today this information will be useful. So just to go a little back, you know, cells have a lot of things, have you know, the membrane, have the nucleus, have chromosomes and so on. And have one thing called organelles. Organelles are for the cell what organs are for humans. So have uh, your lungs to breathe, you have your eyes to see, you know, and you have organelles to do different things. 
important for us today is the mitochondrion that in the singular for it of the mitochondria. What mitochondria does, as we said, is to generate most of the energy we use in our body. And they do that putting in a molecule called ATP. We're going to talk a little more about that after. Uh, but it's important that we understand that to regenerate energy, uh, energy in the mitochondria in a way the cell could use. And the cell could use is ATP. A little more interesting too, you know, and this is one of the reasons why mitochondria was always my favorite organelle, is that mitochondria have their own DNA inside it. It's the only organelle in our body that does have DNA. And this always came, most 99.9 .9 points of the time, the mitochondria is coming only for the mother. Uh, the mitochondria, and I'm not kidding here, is the, one of the reasons why we're here today. If you ever heard about uh, civilization filters or life filters uh, to see why it could be so rare to find in, intelligent life around the universe, we're going to see that some, some kind of filters could and should happen. At least this is part of the hypothesis. And one of the filters is that maybe life is really common around the universe, but multicellular life are really difficult to find. You know, most part of the organisms in our story and right now are unicellular. You know, a lot of bacteria, a lot of archaea and so on. What made multicellular life possible were the mitochondria. At one point, billions and billions of years ago, one, one uh, really strange bacteria tried to eat another bacteria and they were not able to. But this bacteria that were not being digested were really good to produce energy, where the big bacteria were really good in giving protection. There was kind of agreement between them. There was, as long as you know, the only time this ever happened. And this bacteria that was not, was not uh, consumed by the cell become our mitochondria. So our mitochondria come from a different organism that fusioned with us. And this is what made possible to have multicellular organisms. So the mitochondria is quite, quite important for a lot of different reasons. And for today, we're talking about their importance on producing energy. Uh, but when I was studying this mitochondria and was analyzing the data, I'm going to talk more about it. I was trying to think about mitochondria could be the cause of the difference I was seeing. You know, I don't need you guys to really go there and read this paper. What I need you guys to understand here is that when I started to think about mitochondria, let's get back here. You said that mitochondria is quite a basic thing, you know, it's a basic thing of life. I'll cells in your body does have mitochondria. So if this is so basic, if it is so, so important, why no one never saw that? When I start to propose that to people, I was quite afraid, you know, people are going to think I'm dumb, people are going to think it's stupid. This is so important, someone has to be self first. I cannot be the first one to see it. And I was quite happy I was not. I was not the first one to see it. The first one, as far as I, I could remember, could see, to specifically point to the mitochondria, was this paper for 2004, when they tried to see what was different between muscles on space and on Earth, and could see a specific mitochondrial pattern on gene expression, you know, how the genes became proteins and so on. The genes on the mitochondria related to the mitochondria seemed to be strange on space. It was the first time someone was saying directly that. And he was thinking his conclusion from that, his interpretation that maybe mitochondria in space have problems producing energy. They produce insufficient energy and they produce more reactive oxygen species. We're going to talk more about that. You know, the mitochondria is not working well. And they call it the mitochondria hypothesis. I'm quite happy because this is how I call it my own hypothesis when I start to call it, uh, to, to have it. And I was quite happy to see I was not the first one. Uh, I was even more happier that they, they have not gone through. Not because, of course, they probably were said by that, but I was happy I was the one selling it. 
And it's important for you guys to understand that knowledge are complicated and the universe don't care that we divide things on physics, biology, chemistry, politics, and so on. You know why they have not pursued this if they think they thought could be that important? Because, uh, because they could not. Because the Columbia tragedy happened and they didn't have more space on, on different shuttles to send their experiments. So they have to stop. I tried to find if they got through the, the experiment to do new experiments, but they have not. They had this good hypothesis and they have not go through it. What worked well for me. But there was not the only one, you know. This is uh, is like directly from NASA. You can go here, take my my reference and take all the slides for you. They're talking more about plants, if you want to talk about the influence of microgravity on plants. And was one study that saw the mitochondria of the roots in soybean on microgravity is not well. They're supposed to be in one form, you know, the polymorphic shape, higher in matrix energy, and they are not. To say the truth, for me, this, is the, this was the first thing I found of mitochondria. The oldest was this one, but the first I was able to see was this one. And as you could think right now, oh, plants do have mitochondria. Yes, plants do have mitochondria. We do not have chloroplasts, but plants do have mitochondria. So you start to see how, how important it is because this mitochondria is not only on your cells, it's all the cells of multinuclear, multicellular organisms that include plants, that include fungi, that include any animal we could think, that include some parasites and so on. So if it's so basic things changing in space, everything related to that should be changed, should be altered too. So what we did have, and, and, and why no one got to that, you know, why no one got and got through that? Because first, this paper is quite difficult to find. You know, when I finally was able to find this paper, this paper is from 2007 in Ukrainian. Now, I don't know how to read on Ukrainian, so I could never really read this paper. I'm, I'm basing this in a read that a NASA scientist had. So I believe on him because you know he is reporting, but I myself cannot read. So you see, it was not science is not only about science; it's really about the world around. If this person had wrote in English, maybe I could read. If there was no accident or challenge, maybe the people in Japan could, would be able to go through their experiments, but they could not. And I was lucky enough to be part of another Gen Lab, but where we're doing analysis. There is a really busy, busy uh, slide. But I want you to focus on two things. There are two groups of different, uh, of different cells and animals. One group was on Earth, one group go to space. This is the simple experimental design. You have a control and you have a test. The control is the cells, animals, or the astronauts that was measured on Earth, where the test is the cells, animals, or astronauts that was measured on the International Space Station. We compare both and you try to see what you do. In this case, we're comparing everything we could find. We were comparing gene expressions, which genes, all of it, proteins and other markers. The next uh, slide, you'll be as busy as this one, but I don't need you to be afraid. I only want you to understand that when we analyze the expression of human cells and animal muscles and different mice organs, we start to see a lot of things, a lot of these bubbles linked to the other related to mitochondrial activity. We see in the organs, we see in the cells, we see in the muscles. And as mitochondria is so important for a different kind of things, we would imagine that everything related to it are, are affected too. So now we go to our second part. You know, I was able to tell you that this was important and I hope I have convinced you that mitochondria is important for space. Now we're going to talk a little why. And for that, we have to go a little down here. I'm talking about energy, you know, energy, but energy could be quite, quite difficult to define, principally in biology. So let's use something that I hope you guys know and I hope you guys like, called a Mars bars. Have you ever eat, ate one? So there's a Mars bars, 
It's a candy, you know. And if you go to this candy and you eat that candy, you're going to absorb 228 kilocalories. Or they also put in kilojoules. This is how much energy there is in this bar. But this is a little abstract yet. What this means? What does energy means? This energy means that every Mars bars have this, the, the energy necessary to put uh, the battery of 50 iPhones. 50 iPhones. So every iPhone have 150 of, a bat of energy of a Mars bars. I know you can use like a lot and see a lot of videos with your full battery for iPhone. You can drive a car uh, with three, with one mile with a car with three Mars bars. One car, three Mars bars for a mile. We can uh, drive a school bus for a mile with 10 Mars bars. And you can uh, use an electric kettle to boil water with a little more than one third of a Mars bars. You know, because what we want here on the kilocalorie, if you're going to define kilocalorie, what kilocalorie is, is the energy necessary to heat the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. If I have 100 kilocalories and starting with a really cold water, we can boil it. This is why we need less than one third of uh, Mars bars to make a kettle be really, to boil a kettle. Okay, uh, I hope I identified you how much energy you have in this Mars bars, but how, how we could use that normally, you know, how we could use that to normal means of energy. To what, what what energy there is there, you know, uh, and the sugar. Most part of Mars bar, the principal thing is going to have in Mars bars is sugar. Most part of this sugar will be a molecule called glucose. And I hope you guys at this point have heard about this word, glucose. Is one kind of sugar the most common we we eat. This is why things are sweet. And I have you, I need you guys to see here that here I have a really complex molecule, glucose, and here I have a really, really much more simple molecule called carbon dioxide, CO2. So I start with a really complex molecule and I ended up with a really simple molecule. And this is the reaction, a complex here with oxygen becoming CO2 plus water. This is called an exothermic uh, reaction, and you can see a lot of kilojoules getting out of it. So this is the reaction to take energy from the sugar to become like lasting and having this energy exothermic. How you call it? You call it combustion. It's basically you putting fire in the Mars bars. If you put fire in the Mars bars, they use that as fuel. This is how much energy the Mars bars are going to give out on certain being from sugar to carbon dioxide. I hope I have convinced you now that you can take this energy from Mars bars, but I would be quite surprised now if any or one of you guys listen to me are on fire. I hope you are not. And if you are, maybe you are a superhero from Marvel. So no, let's have a talk. But you could imagine that our body is not really good to put ourselves on fire. This is the exact reaction we do in the mitochondria. But if we imagine that we're not going to do that in one step, okay? We need some steps to do that. So at this point, I hope I have convinced you that you can have energy in the Mars bars and you can take energy by the, from the Mars bars in different ways, for example, putting fire on it, and that we can try to extract the same energy doing the same thing in a slightly different ways. And as everyone here is not on fire, well, we have to find a way. So we have to convert this energy from Mars bars, from sugar, to us in a way we could use. Would lead us to the next step. How do we extract this energy then? You know, let's go a little to engineering. Maybe some of you guys want to do engineering. It would be a wonderful profession. So how you convert, how you take this heat? For example, if you take fire, you put fire on the Mars bars, how we can convert 
this true energy that we could use in our houses, you know, to electricity. In this case here, you could use, for example, the fuel to boil water and create a high pressure steam that are going to move a turbine. This turbine could move a uh, coiled copper wire with a round, uh, round magnets. These were going to create a electromagnetic field that are going to create a flux of high uh, energy electrons. So we are transforming the energy from heat to electricity. So we can transform one energy of the other. In this case, heat. Uh, this is an important thing we're going to need here. So the turbines are moving and converting one thing on the other. This is not the only way we can make electricity. We can make electricity from water. We can use solar energy that's going to evaporate the water. They're going to become uh, clouds. The clouds are going to go down. And if you have a reservoir for this, you can use this difference, you know, this potential energy here to go down to move a turbine that you're going to have a, a letter uh, uh, copper wire and magnets that are going to create a field and going to create electricity. So you can convert kinetic energy to electric energy. Makes sense? I hope it does. So we need to convert energy. And we need to convert energy to what? You know, we need to convert energy to ATP. This is the molecule that we were talking about, ATP. So we have a lot of energy here that you have to transfer to us. We take this 1,200 kilojoules for every mole of molecules. You have to be able to transfer that to ATP. How we do it? How, how our mitochondria does it? We do on different steps, okay? So what we want to do is have two ATPs and put one other, another fosso, uh, another uh, phosphate group here. But they don't want to be together. You see, they're quite negative, 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 negative. They don't want to be together. They want to go. So it's quite easier for them to, to, to break. It's quite difficult to put them together and quite easier to make them break. And when they break, then they give some energy out. So again, you are putting some energy there. And so why we're putting ATP? Because we can use it. It's a way we can use it. We cannot use uh, heat. We cannot use electrons. You can use ATP. So we have to put whatever energy there is on the sugar on this molecule. And you do that on the mitochondria. First, you do the glycolysis. We break it. Then we go to the Krebs cycle, and maybe you have heard about it on your high school, but you're probably going to see that on the on college much more. And then we it's important here that you take the name electron transport chain, and then you produce ATP. In this case here, when you're producing energy, you're taking a potential and putting two electrons. So I, I hope that you can see that electricity is energy, you know, we are using right now. I have lights, I have this computer that's powered by electrons, by electricity. And we do have one point in our mitochondria that are going to transport these electrons and going to transfer this energy to ATP. So this process can be quite, quite difficult to explain and I'm not going to get on the details of it. I just want you to understand that every time you go, every part that you go here, glycolysis, crabs, and so on, is to take electrons for your molecules and put in a way you could use to produce ATP. So you start to break the glucose to pyruvate, you break the pyruvate to SATU-CoA, and every time you do that, we take electrons. And when you go to the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, we start to take carbons of your, of your sugar. This is where you produce CO2, you know, you produce when you, you breathe. And every time you break the molecule, every time you break the different uh, bonds of the molecule, you extract electrons. And all the electrons you extract, you put in two different molecules. Not H and fat HU. It's not that important you remember the names. It's important that you see that they have hydrogens. Why? Because on the last step, they're going to uh, they're going to react with oxygen 
and they're going to produce ATP. They're going to put all these electrons in the respiratory electrons transfer chain and then produce ATP. And this point you should be, but how? You know, I understood that they were extracting electrons because you know electricity and light and so on, but how how we're going to do that? Okay. So the way you're going to do that is related to the production of energy, like on this, the electric, the hydroelectric dam. So we will understand that you have a lot of water passing through a turbine, you can generate electricity. It's okay, isn't it? You're going to move a turbine, the turbine is going to create a laser magnetic field, they're going to create electricity. So far, so good, I hope. We're going to do something very similar in our cells. We are going to put hydrogens out. So every time you to taking these molecules and extracting electrons, you give one electron to this electric uh, carriers, these proteins on the membrane of the of the uh, mitochondria. And every time this electron go to one protein to another, they're going to be less, less energy. But every time they use this energy to put hydrogens out of the mitochondria. So there are more hydrogens out of the mitochondria that are hydrogens in the mitochondria. We are creating our reservoir, not of water in this case, but of hydrogen. And when the hydrogen get back, then you produce the ATP. How you produce ATP? Exactly like this, using a turbine. We have one protein we call ATP synthase. And every time one hydrogen got in, they move, the, uh, the protein moves. And every time they move one little, they put one ATP close together. One hydrogen enter ATP, another hydrogen ATP, another hydrogen ATP. So use ele electrons to put the hydrogen out and use elect uh, hydrogen to make ATP. And now you could use. And if you don't think that beautiful, oh my God, because it is. We, as we have a turbine in our cells, a lot of turbines, a lot of turbines, biological turbines, that instead of producing electricity, is producing ATP from electricity. <laughs> so we do use electricity in a process similar to what it is combustion. So we are basically putting fire and make electricity in different ways and then putting ATP because this is the way we could use. Okay, if you are not bored and if you could think right now, what does have to do with space? You know, how space could change it if I'm right? You know, is mitochondria is really affected? How this, how this could be? We have to think that space is different from Earth. It's different in a lot of ways. They have a lot of risks. But for today, two risks are more important for us: radiation and gravity. There are much more radiation on space than on Earth because our electromagnetic field protect us from most part of space radiation. And when we were in space, we were in microgravity, you know, things are floating around. Everything's floating around, including the things inside your cells. How this could change, what happens? So if you got back to the production of electron, every time an electron go to these proteins, the, sometimes they don't want you. You know, it's not like they're have to, we make it as best as you can for them to pass to one protein or the other, but sometimes they leak. And if they leak, they can find oxygen. The whole reason you breathe is because you need this electron to go to the oxygen in the first place. You know, these electrons start to pass to one protein to the other, to one protein to the other, until they got to the oxygen, you're just breathing reacting with the hydrogen on your cells and produce water. So you need this oxygen and you need this to happen. What you don't need this is to, uh, to find the oxygen when uh, it not, sh should not be. You know, instead of producing water, producing reactive, reactive species of oxygen. 
reactive oxygen species. As you could imagine by the name, this could be bad because a reactive oxygen species can react with everything. And we don't know that to happen. One of the problems of that is that we have a lot of oxygen. We have what's called oxi oxidative stress. We have it normally, you know, it's the price that we have to be alive. We need oxygen and this does happen. And this is part of makes we age, but, but if this starts happening too fast, we're going to age much faster. Our cells could have a lot of problems. Our cells could even die. The problem with these radicals is that they can react with everything, including DNA of the cells, breaking the DNA, causing damage to the DNA, making the cell stop working, or maybe even cause cancer. So we don't want that to happen, would we? But the thing is, the whole part is that uh, radiation can make this ox this uh, electrons be moved energy and produce high energy molecules, including oxygen. So being on space by itself could increase the quantity of, ox of oxygen in reactive species that you have. And this could do influence how the mitochondria produce energy by itself, because then a lot of things start to react in the mitochondria where they should not, the proteins don't work as they should, and then you don't have that much energy as you should, you know? This was the hypothesis of this Japanese guy in the beginning. And we can see this as a real possibility. So radiation by itself could be the cause of why mitochondria is affected. But not only that. All of this, all of this hydrogens go out and all of these hydrogens go back. And I can only tell them the name because I'm really not a physicist. Of course, respect uh, our equation. An equation in this case that's called a steady state nurse Planck equation. You don't need to, to decorate that, they're not going to be in any test. But the important part of it is that one part of it is the concentration, good. One part of, of it is the charge, you know, hydrogens are positive and the mitochondria is negative, so it's even easier for the hydrogen to go back and even more difficult to make them go in. But also there are some ways on this equation that are represented by gravitational, centrifugal, or magnetic forces. The three of the things that are different on space. So, and this is a hypothesis, you know, it's not something that we, we were able to measure yet. It's the one thing that I'm really keen to measure is to see how this, this equation would work different on space. Because if this happens on the mitochondria, this is going to happen in any other event that needs ions going out and ions going back. And you know where this happens a lot? On your neurons, all of it. Of course, should not be that strong because if it is, the astronauts will be dead by now. We're not going to be able to pass a year in space as they do, and they do. So maybe it's just small. But you know, when you think about colonizing space and start to be one year, two years, three years in space, maybe the case, this is when you start to think about it because the problems start to, to pile up. Okay, so I told you that this could affect the whole body. And you should be asking yourself now, why? Okay, William, I understand that maybe I'm not producing that much uh, energy. Okay, that is bad by itself. Would be really, really tired easier, but maybe I just can take a nap, isn't it? Like maybe instead of working eight hours a day, I work like four and then I take a nap and play video games. And uh, unfortunately not, because the thing about this, the, this production of energy is that to not occur in the vacuum. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, normally I don't use Wikipedia, but I really like this picture. They try to put the metabolism linked with each other. Have you ever had to use a train station or the subway? You know, if you ever got to London or Paris or one of the big cities where they have subways, you know, they didn't have one on the city I was born. So the first time I used uh, a subway, I was quite confused. But the thing with a subway is that all the stations are linked to each other. 
Now, if you want to one station to go to the other, you have to go all the way until you go. But you see they are connected. You can go from a C, on one point of their subway network until the other, passing through different places. This is true to subways, this is true for people in the subways, and this is true for metabolism. And as you could see here, the TCA cycle and the producing of ATP is linked to everyone else, everything else. I really like this, this, uh, this map, but there's one thing I really dislike it. Is the TCA cycle be here a little more on your, on your uh, left? Why? Because this is not how it works. I'm going to show to you the really met, the real metabolic map. And this is, and even this is a simplified version. But you see there are much more stations, much more molecules involved. And if you see here, you're going to see a circle. This circle is the Krebs cycle. This circle is the TCA cycle. It's the same, the same thing, just a different name. So the TCA cycle is central to everything of that happens in your metabolism. Things that happen in your liver and your muscle and your brain and your kidney and your eye and in different cells and so on. The mitochondria is the center of the metabolism. So if you change anything here, you can change anything around, anything. Okay, so you should be asking yourself now, if this is so complicated, why, what could be happening? You know, a lot of things. The mitochondria, mitochondrial diseases, and you do have mitochondrial diseases, primary and secondary, could affect different organs in different ways. You know, and you do know that there are things affecting astronauts that are different. You will know that it's more common that astronauts, the men astronauts, a problem with the retina, where women have more problems on their, on their hearing. Uh, and then if you see, these are related to the mitochondria. So they could cause neurodegeneration and stroke and muscle weakness and infertility and so on. But the thing is, not one mitochondrial disease is equal to the other. They can affect different organs. Some organs don't seem to be even related to the other. They can affect any organ or just one. There's just one thing that mitochondrial dysfunction have similar to any other mitochondrial disease. All the mitochondrial disease have one thing in common. They are progressive. So if you think in a trip to Mars that take three years, you know, maybe one year in space what Scott Kelly did, because not going to change that much. But three years maybe did, and maybe five do, because as time goes up, the effects pile up. So we have to find a way now how to get the stressed mitochondria to be healthy mitochondria. And this is what we don't know. And this is our challenge today. And this is something I hope you guys watching me today are going to help me do, because of course I cannot do that alone. No one can do research alone. And there's a possibility. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But at least I hope you, you thought that having the information that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell was finally useful. And with that, my people, I finish. And if you have any question, it will be my pleasure to answer it. Okay. Thank you so much, William. That was brilliant. Stop sharing.